Hello everyone, my name is Rebecca and welcome back to... Okay, I gotta take this thing off, it doesn't feel right. Today we'll be talking about Mary Morstan and how the way Stephen and Mark have written her supports TJLC. It's actually some of the strongest evidence of their intent with the show. They took John Watson's perfectly sweet wife from the stories and turned her into an assassin who kills Sherlock, lies and manipulates Sherlock and John at every turn, and is a danger to literally everyone around her. She's a villain, and they were telling you that from the start. Of course, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's hear it from someone who even people who like Mary trust. Amanda Abington. For for um, for Mark and Amanda, if you could describe your character with the song. Okay. Mine's smack my bitch up. No, it's not. <laughs> oh God. The prodigy. That was the prodigy. There is an actual song called. I'm no, I can't say that. <laughs> I, fuck it, I'm gonna. Oh, you, you... I want to talk to you about your character. I did not trust her from the beginning. No. No, did you not? Of course not? I love that you didn't trust her from the beginning. That's in, that's very insightful, because I totally did. John says in you, I've got to keep my eye on you, because the first word that Sherlock says is Mary. It's like, OK, OK, this is good. So this, so I've got to, she has to manage the next part of this um, story. I mean, I knew she had a secret, but I didn't know it was going to be that enormous, and that's chilling, actually. There is a difference uh, between Mary's character from season three to season four. Um, I can't tell you what it is, uh, but season four was so much more fun to play than season three, and you will find out why when you watch it, but be prepared. Little did I know I'd have to shoot the hero, because it's a rock She doesn't want to lose John, and she knows that if this secret ever gets out, she'll lose him. I knew she'd done something in a, in a, in a past life, but I didn't know what it was, so the fact that she does the ultimate yeah. betrayal and sort of shoots Sherlock was, um, yeah, it was great. It was great to play. <laughs> yeah, there is, yeah, I don't know. She, yeah, I mean, she, the baby <laughs> the features. That's all I can tell you. I can't tell you anything else. So just wait. You have to be patient. It will be out when it's out. And then all will be revealed in its beautifulness. But I can't tell you. But you might. You might not. John just looks at her with utter contempt and shock and hatred. Um, I would say to Mary, if I met her in real life, my God, you look a lot like me. Uh, it's uncanny. And stop assassinating people because it's just getting stupid now. Um, and just behave. Behave yourself, Mary. That's what I'd say to her. And she would probably have killed me. So, yeah. Also, to clarify, one of those was from a multi-part behind-the-scenes thing, and Mary was grouped in under the villain section. So I'm actually going to be spending most of the video talking about how Mary has been shown to be a villain. But you have to understand that establishing she's a villain supports TJLC. They really didn't have to make John's wife one of the major antagonists. The fact that she's a villain not only tells us that John's marriage isn't permanent, but like I talked about in my last video, it creates an expectation for the audience that John's arc will be resolved when he finds a relationship with someone he's attracted to, trusts, and loves more than anyone else in the world. Let's start by going back to the origins of the Mary Morstan character. Like Fox talked about in the video we did together on the canon, there's a lot of confusion amongst home scholars about Watson's wife or wives. When Watson first meets Mary in The Sign of the Four, it's just after Holmes has ordered him to suppress the facts relating to a romance from now on. Then Mary Morstan comes in and Watson apparently falls in love with her at first sight. And he says a lot of sweet things about her in this story, but like Fox mentioned, there are a lot of similarities between Mary and Holmes that indicate that Watson might be lying. Then there's the fact that after this story, Watson never seems as happy or as in love with her ever again. She's just someone he mentions at the start of some stories to remind people that he's married and so he can't be in love with Holmes, right? 
in addition to that, the timeline for the marriage is very confusing, and a lot of the details in the canon that contradict themselves are about Watson's marriage. Mark Gatiss said pretty recently that he believes that Watson and Mary probably had a very messy divorce in the canon, since we never learn exactly what happened to her. That would be good enough if it were true, but I'm fairly certain he's actually downplaying things considering the way they've adapted her. In his last vow, Mary Morstan is just a name taken from a gravestone. That could mean they believe something similar about Mary Morstan in the canon. Then there's the fact that in our version, John's wife isn't just an adaptation of Mary Morstan. Her real name is A-G-R-A a reference to the cursed Agra treasure in the Sign of the Four, which ruined the lives of everyone who came across it. They didn't have to include that reference, much less make it her name. And yet they did. Then, most damningly, there are the parallels between Mary and Sebastian Moran. I first came across these parallels in a meta written by Bronte. You can find both that meta and her WordPress linked down below. Here's a quick summary of some of the parallels. In the stories, Moran was there on the falls of the Reichenbach and witnessed Holmes surviving. In our version, in order for Moriarty to fake his death, someone would have had to help him spray fake blood, just like we saw in The Abominable Bride. Specifically, someone who could make a very precise shot. Moran is introduced in a story called The Empty House and is first mentioned in relation to a fatal card game. In BBC Sherlock, the scene about the truth of Mary's identity takes place in what Sherlock helpfully calls The Empty House. A place Sherlock won in a nearly fatal game of cards. Do you own this place? Mm, I won it in a card game with the Clarence House cannibal. It nearly cost me my kidneys, but Fortunately, I had a straight flush. Quite a gambler, that woman. Sebastian was involved in some trouble overseas before he came back to England, acquired an evil name, and became Moriarty's chief of staff. Mary likewise got into some trouble overseas. By your skill set, you are or were an intelligence agent. Your accent is currently English, but I suspect you are not. You are on the run from something. You've used your skills to disappear. Acquired a false name to hide. Mary Morstan was stillborn in October 1972. Her gravestone is in Chiswick Cemetery, where five years ago you acquired her name and date of birth, and thereafter her identity. And following the pattern, then started working for Moriarty. Moran's most notable characteristic, apart from his ruthless determination, was his shooting prowess. <laughs> In order to confront Moran, Holmes and Watson hid out in an empty house and set up a dummy for Moran to take aim at, which would expose him to Holmes and the police. In Sherlock's setup, not only will Mary be exposed to the police if she tries anything violent, How good a shot are you? How badly do you want to find out? If I die here, my body will be found in a building with your face projected on the front of it. Even Scotland Yard could get somewhere with that but he creates the setup so that she'll expose herself to John. Not that obvious a trick. And there are things that she's been involved with that we haven't been told yet, things that Magnuson finds hilarious. Ooh, she's gone a bit freelance now. Bad girl. <laughs> oh, she's so wicked. I can really see why you like her. We'll definitely be getting into that more in series four, and it will definitely reveal that she's been working with Moriarty. And again, think about this. Moriarty's number one operative isn't being used to directly threaten Sherlock, but to be in a relationship with John and rub it in Sherlock's face. The only reason Moriarty would be doing this is if he has a romantic interest in Sherlock, and if he thinks that John being romantically unavailable will hurt Sherlock, will burn out his heart. Again, Mary being given this role in the story does nothing but confirm TJLC. While Mary has probably been working in the background for Moriarty the entire time, especially with all those hints of happy co-workers getting together despite one of them being unhappily married, they've been setting up this plot the entire time. I'm going to focus on the episodes where she makes an actual appearance. Let's start with what we know about her. Mm -hmm. 
Mary is an only child, which relates to her not having a family anymore, it's possible she did something to them. She's a linguist, indicating that she's probably a non-native English speaker. She's clever, but she's also short-sighted, which, even if it's referring to her actual eyesight textually, always indicates a more figurative short-sightedness. She works as a part-time nurse in the same clinic as John. She reads The Guardian, and I don't know enough about English media to draw any conclusions from that, but Bronte did give me some information about the Lib Dem party, specifically that a lot of left-leaning people dislike them for their willingness to work with bad people. She's disillusioned and romantic, which contradict each other, and hint a little bit at the persona she's putting on, but also the internal conflict she's dealing with. She's a cat lover when John doesn't like cats and Sherlock prefers dogs. She has an appendix scar and a secret tattoo, both of which probably relate to her past life. She's a size 12. She bakes her own bread, which I'll be coming back to in a few minutes. And she is a liar. Liar ends up being her most important trait. In the second flurry, all the other words disappear, leaving just that one, making it the only sure thing we know about her. Still, the other terms were intentionally chosen, so here's the sketch of Mary's true character that I draw from them. Mary is resourceful and is able to read situations and mold herself to them. She is actually quite jaded, that comes up in a lot of her actions, but she holds on to some hope that she can get what she wants if she shapes the situation just right. She works as a nurse part-time rather than full-time to give herself some time away from her pretend life. She gets tired of pretending and can't maintain the facade forever. She's willing to do anything to achieve her ends, even work with people she dislikes. And while she's very good at handling problems in the moment. She's impulsive, and her long-term plans tend not to work out. That's why she had to go on the run before, and that's why every time she acts on her own, it doesn't go well for her. Her alliance with Moriarty isn't out of loyalty, but because he's powerful and can help her get what she wants. They aren't on very good terms most of the time. What Mary wants is to have possession of John. Going back to M-theory, she does things, like holding on to John when she's asleep, or being fed up with the way that John would rather be with Sherlock, that don't make sense if it's just a job to her. She really does want a romantic partner, it's just on her very particular terms. Moriarty probably knew that when he sent her in. He's very good at reading people. And he probably figured that her determination to keep John would help him keep Sherlock away from John. We have to remember when looking at all of this that John's main problem in the story is that he was betrayed and hurt in the past, and that he has problems letting other people in. So to end up with someone who does nothing but lie to him about her violent and evil past is about the worst thing that could happen to John. Especially Especially when the only thing he actually wanted out of their relationship was someone safe who wouldn't break his heart. Let's look now at some of the things that Mary does in the story. She's introduced twice with her face hidden, which tends to be used for villains. Let's use some of the characters on this show as a comparison. <laughs> Moriarty is a bit of an odd one out here because his first on-screen appearance is face-on, but counterbalancing that, he's in disguise here. He's been acting as a faceless force in the narrative for two and a half episodes up until this point, and when he is finally revealed, his face is partially concealed. Back to that graveyard scene, John is clearly using Mary as a crutch to deal with losing Sherlock. That's a weird choice if their relationship is meant to be permanent, especially considering that the person that John is grieving is actually alive. If what draws them together is John's grief over Sherlock, that's inevitably going to get messed up when Sherlock returns and it does. Some people think that John isn't aware that he's settling for Mary, but he very much is. He even acknowledges in his proposal that things haven't turned out the way he wanted, but that being with her is the best thing he could hope for at this point. As you know, these last couple of years haven't been easy for me. But meeting you, yeah, meeting you has been the best thing that could have possibly happened. He's shocked when she agrees, because he doesn't actually mean the words. I agree. What? I agree I'm the best thing that could have happened to you. <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, it's, um, 
We also see here that Mary is more than a little condescending. She actually believes that she's the best thing that could have ever happened to him. She also laughs at his attempt at a proposal. If you'll have me, Mary, could you see your way, um... <clears throat> Even when she's playing nice, she's always mocking his attempts to be romantic. Mary clearly thinks John is a bit of an idiot, but she likes him because she thinks she can control him. Their engagement literally gets put on hold because Sherlock returns, and like I've said before, that's a very telling choice. Mary starts off pretending not to know who Sherlock is, despite the fact that she's commented and been on his blog before, so she definitely knows what he looks like. She knows who he is, she's just creating more emotional tension. John? John, what is it? No, you. Oh yes. Oh my God. I'm not great. You died. You jumped off a roof. No. You're dead. Oh my God. Oh my God. Do you have any idea what you've done? It's likely that Moriarty gave her a heads up that Sherlock was arriving and told her what to do. She plays up what Sherlock did to get John more upset, not because she actually cares about his feelings. We see this in the next restaurant scene as she starts siding with Sherlock to unsettle John. Oh, so this was your brother's plan. Oh, well, he would have needed a confidant. Mm -hmm. Sorry. And in the restaurant after that, she's completely fed up with John's emotional reaction. This is my fault. Oh, God. Why am I the only one who thinks that this is wrong? The only one reacting like a human being. Overreact. Overreacting. John! Oh, so it's still a secret, is it? Yes, it's still a secret. She doesn't actually care about his feelings, she just uses them to get him to do what she wants. When she can't control them, she finds them irksome. Outside, she mocks Sherlock for being bad at manipulating people, since she does it so effortlessly. Gosh, you don't know anything about human nature, do you? Nature? No. Human? No. She demonstrates this when she offers to talk John around. I'll talk him around. You will? Oh, yeah. Again, she doesn't care about her feelings, she's controlling him, and she likes doing that. She'd rather not keep Sherlock so close when she knows how John feels about Sherlock. But she has orders, and she'll follow them as long as it seems like Moriarty will deliver on whatever he's promising her, probably to take Sherlock out of the picture for good. In the car, she starts pushing John back towards Sherlock. Can you believe his nerve? I like him. What? On a first watch, you don't notice how odd that is because you want someone to be pushing John and Sherlock together. But it just establishes how little she cares about John's feelings. She thinks she knows what's best for him. The next morning, she logs on to John's account and starts reading one of his unpublished blog entries, mocking the way he describes Sherlock. His movements were so silent, so furtive, he reminded me of a trained bloodhound picking out a scent. You are. He tells her not to keep reading it, but she doesn't listen. I couldn't help thinking what an amazing criminal he'd make if he turned his talents against the law. Don't read that. Famous blog, finally. Come on, that's... Ancient history, yes, I know, but it's not, though, is it? Because he's... And she makes fun of him for obviously shaving his mustache for Sherlock, to the point that John makes it clear that one of the main reasons he's marrying her is so that people will stop talking about him and Sherlock. God, I know, six months of bristly kisses for me, and then his nibs turns up. Nice. I don't shave for Sherlock Holmes. <sighs> You should put that on a t-shirt. Shut up. Or what? Or I'll marry you. It's always been a bit of a sore spot for him. One of the only times she and John kiss is when she finally convinces John to go back to Sherlock. Hmm. You sure? I'm sure. Okay. Wait for Kath, I'll see you later. In other words, after she's successfully manipulated him. This scene is one of the ones later overlaid with the word liar, even though Sherlock was never there, so couldn't have been remembering this, so you know. That's fun, she's lying here. Later on that evening, she gets a text from Moriarty warning about the bonfire, but the text also includes taunting messages about choosing between John and James. Even though she obviously recognizes the skip code and so knows what the message says, she takes the phone to Sherlock. It's the skip code. Password, then every third. Save John Watson. Like Nat said in M Theory, either she knew to take it to Sherlock, or she called Moriarty for clarification, who told her to take it to Sherlock. And that was what she was supposed to do. The later texts are clearly meant for him.
Again, this is part of a bigger scheme. Mary is just one piece in the game. At the bonfire, we get one of the first major indications that Sherlock's love for John is much deeper than Mary's. Not only did he earlier respect his boundaries, while Mary stays safely back from the flames, Sherlock dives straight in to save John. <laughs> John! John! John. So not only would John rather be with Sherlock, but Sherlock also cares about John more. Sherlock also talks about Mary like a future John might have had if he had never come back. If I hadn't come back, you wouldn't be standing there. You'd still have a future. With Mary. Yeah. I know. Sherlock knows that the bomb is off at this point, so he's talking about more than just that. John's relationship is doomed to fail because of him. But Sherlock still supports it because he wants John to be happy and he feels like he's ruined things between them. That's just another difference between Sherlock and Mary. Sherlock apologizes for what he did again and again. Sorry, sorry again. Yeah. Sorry. Forgive me. What? Please, John, forgive me for all the hurt that I caused you. John, you have endured war and injury and tragic loss. So sorry again about that last one. And he respects John's boundaries after that first night. He doesn't seek him out again. Sherlock does whatever he can to make sure John is happy and safe. Mary does none of these things. We see at the end of the episode in this exchange that Mary is aware that Sherlock interrupted John's proposal on purpose. A spring wedding. Yeah, well once I've actually got engaged. Yeah. We were interrupted last time. Yeah. But she orders him to be at the wedding anyway. I'll be there, Sherlock. Weddings, not really my thing. Moriarty wants Sherlock to be there to help burn out his heart, and she'll love bragging that she won John in the end. And that's just what she does, and she clearly, thoroughly enjoys it. So that's him. This is Major Schulte and Jim. Uh huh. They're such good friends. Why does he barely even mention him? He mentions him all the time to me, he never shuts up about him. About him? Mm -hmm. I didn't think he'd show up at all. John says he's the most unsociable man he's ever met. He is. He's the most unsociable. Mm. That's why he's bunting around him like a puppy. <gasps> oh, Sherlock. Neither of us were the first, you know. Stop smiling. It's my wedding day. Still, do you remember how I mentioned that she's a part-time nurse because she needs time away from the facade? She can't hold this forever. Oh, I'm starving. Thanks. Do you so much weight to get into this dress? <laughs> she's changed herself too much to fit into her relationship. It's only a matter of time before she slips back into old habits. And we see in a flashback that she was desperate to get time alone. I told you to find him a new case. I'm trying. You need to run him, okay? Show him it's still the good old days. Just gonna take him out for a bit. Run him. I know. You said you'd find him a case. Also, the writers make it a point to let us know that literally everyone hates Mary. Mm, hates you. Can't even better think about you. <clears throat> Who else hates me? Oh, great. Thanks. There are a lot of small hints here that she has bad intentions. She's framed so that she has devil horns. And is wearing a shirt that screams that her signals aren't what they appear. She's probably rendezvousing with Moriarty, but she could be trying to hook up with David. We see in this episode that Mary is yet another character with a very obvious type. David! <laughs> you went out with her for two years. Uh, ages ago. We're, t we're just good friends now. Is that a fact? Whenever she tweets, you respond within five minutes, regardless of time or current location, suggesting you have her on text alert in all your Facebook photographs of the happy couple Mary takes centre frame, whereas John is always partly or entirely excluded. <laughs> you can't assume from that I've still got some kind of interest in Mary. You volunteered to be a shoulder to cry on on no less than three separate occasions. Do you have anything to say in your defence? Which brings me to the reveal at the end of the episode that Mary is pregnant. I don't think for one second that it was accidental. As I see it, there are two possibilities for the baby. Either Mary intentionally got pregnant through David, since she and John aren't having enough sex to make that happen. Remember the doctor with erectile dysfunction? Or there is no baby, and she's faking all the signs of pregnancy. Since the first is pretty straightforward, I'm going to focus on explaining why the latter is in character. First of all, 
all remember how I said I'd come back to Mary baking her own bread? That was a very oddly specific detail, and one of the ways to say that someone is pregnant is to say that they have a bun in the oven. It could be that Mary is baking her own bun, get it? In the story, the sign of the four, the actual sign of the four, was something left by those involved with the Agra treasure to link the characters together and keep them from betraying each other. Here, Agra has every reason to want to do something drastic to keep John with her, even before the best man speech, and especially after. Mary and John, whatever it takes, whatever happens, from now on I swear I will always be there, always, for all three of you. All the signs are there. The signs? Signs of three. In the story, the Agra treasure chest is ultimately empty, so that could either be referring to the flash drive we'll later see, and or Agra herself. And remember, she's short-sighted. She might have thought this was a good idea before she considered the long-term ramifications. She smiles when Sherlock announces the pregnancy, but quickly shifts to panic when she considers what she'll have to do to keep this up. Mary, I think you should do a pregnancy test. Well, I, I, how did he notice before me? I'm a bloody doctor. Put your day off. It's your day stop, off. Stop panicking. I'm not panicking. I'm pregnant. I'm panicking. Don't panic. None of you panic. It only makes things worse when John still isn't enthusiastic about sleeping with her on the honeymoon, so she still can't get pregnant. And it gets even worse in his last vow. Again, Mary needed outlets to keep up her facade, but here she can't let John out of her sight for fear that he'll leave her for Sherlock. And on top of that, not only is Moriarty moving much slower than she probably expected, but Magnuson is constantly breathing down her neck. Moriarty likes to play his pieces against each other. He has no problems betraying people who work with him. I cut loose all those people. All those little problems, even 30 million quid just to get you to come out and play. So she's extremely agitated and can't even pretend to be supportive about Sherlock. <laughs> but is it Sherlock Holmes you want? Because I've not seen him in ages. About a month. Who is Sherlock Holmes? See? That does happen. Their marriage is in trouble because John would rather be with Sherlock, and Mary will do anything to keep that from happening. The dialogue makes it explicit that Mary is using the pregnancy as a way to keep John from leaving. You can't come. You're pregnant. You can't go. I'm pregnant. Except despite all of her best efforts, the universe draws Sherlock and John together like magnets. And she is furious. Miss, what's her? Car, car, get in, please. Yes, of course, get in. Where's John? They're having a fight. Who is? In, both of you, quickly. She refuses to help Billy. <sighs> please. Can I come? I think I've got a broken arm. No, go away. Anyone else? I mean, we're taking everybody home, are we? And is later unsympathetic when she hurts him. Ow. Oh, sorry you moved, but it is just a sprain. Yeah, somebody hit me. She's supposed to be a nurse now, but she really hasn't moved on from her old life. She's more used to hurting people. She gets the opportunity to finally be alone with John and Sherlock reuniting, at least, and she uses it to go after Magnuson. <laughs> She's probably going rogue here, or thinks she is. Again, going back to M theory, it's likely that Moriarty predicted she would eventually do this. Magnuson points out that her actions aren't what John would want. If you're doing this to protect him from the truth, but this is the protection he would want. And here, Mary is presented with her ideal opportunity, the chance to get rid of Sherlock permanently. Even though she has orders not to kill Sherlock, she's thrilled when Magnuson mentions the idea of killing Sherlock too. Kill us both. She'd love to. She hates Sherlock. She hates that she has to work with Sherlock. She only does it to benefit her own ends. She ends up shooting Sherlock anyway, despite her orders, but leaves the barest possibility that he might live so she has an excuse to give to Moriarty. Oh, Sherlock, if you take one more step, I swear I will kill you. No, Mrs. Watson. You won't. In Sherlock's mind, he relates the pain of the gunshot to the pain he experienced at the wedding. This is romantic pain. And Sherlock actually flatlines here. The doctors give up on him. If it was surgery, it was very poorly done, and we know that she's a crack shot. The only reason Sherlock comes back to life is to protect John from his wife. That wife? You're letting him down, Sherlock. John Watson is definitely in danger. And so, much to Mary's shock and annoyance, Sherlock actually lives. He's pulled through. Really? Yeah. Seriously? Oh, are you, Mrs. Watson, you're in big trouble. Really? Why? His first word when he woke up. Mary. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> 
At this point, her priority becomes getting Sherlock not to tell John about her true identity. Because she won't lose John, especially not over this. She will happily kill Sherlock if that's what it takes. You don't tell him. Sherlock. You don't tell John. Look at me. And tell me you're not gonna tell him. When Sherlock runs away, Mary is the one to find him. And again, her intent is to either ensure his silence or kill him if necessary. You were very slow. How good a shot are you? How badly do you want to find out? She only doesn't shoot at what she thinks is him here because Sherlock reminds her that her face is projected on the building. She would get caught. If I die here, my body will be found in a building with your face projected on the front of it. Even Scotland Yard could get somewhere with that. It's at this point we see her true colors. Not only did she shoot Sherlock, actually kill him, and threaten to finish the job multiple times, but she was never going to tell John the truth. Not because of his feelings, but because the truth would cause John to leave, and she can't bear that. John can't ever know that I lied to him. It would break him, and I would lose him forever, and Sherlock, I will never let that happen. Please, understand. There is nothing in this world I would not do to stop that happening. It's entirely selfish. Despite how desperate she is here that John never find out, and how upset she is when she realizes that she's outed herself to John. <sighs> when Sherlock gives her an opening, because both he and John are in danger if he doesn't, she uses it and tries to convince John that he knew what she was all along. Why is she like that? Because you chose her. Perfect. So that's what you were, an assassin. How could I not see that? You did see that. And you married me. Because he's right. It's what you like. Even though she again makes it clear that not only was what she did bad enough to send her to jail forever. The stuff Magnuson has on me, I would go to prison for the rest of my life. So you were just going to kill him? People like Magnuson should be killed. That's why there are people like me. But that John would never love her if he knew what she actually was. Everything about who I was is on there. If you love me, don't read it in front of me. Why? Because you won't love me when you've finished. They draw a lot of attention to that. Even hypothetically, John and Mary could only ever work if they kept on pretending. And the show draws too much attention to the secrets of her past to let them keep pretending forever. Going back to what I said in the video on his last vow, if Mary's shot really was surgery, or if she really called the ambulance, she would bring those things up and use them to her advantage to keep John with her. The same way she grabs onto Sherlock's lie about John knowing what she really was. But she doesn't. She lets Sherlock tell all the lies for her. Her. Why would you help me? Because you saved my life. So, sorry, what? When I happened on you at Magnuson, you had a problem. And remember that one of the first things we learn about John is that he has trust issues. This really is about the worst thing she could have done to him, especially after she lost Sherlock that first time. In addition to lying to him, she made him relive that pain. He never cared about her much to begin with. You're abnormally attracted to dangerous situations and people, so is it truly such a surprise that the woman you fall in love with conforms to that pattern? But she wasn't supposed to be like that. Why is she like that? And this has just pushed everything over the edge. The only reason he goes back to her is because of the baby. You can see in his face in the forgiveness scene that he doesn't forgive her at all. So have you read it? It's clear in his wording too. The problems of your past are your business. The problems of your future are my privilege. All this does not mean that I'm not still basically pissed off with you. No, I know, I know. I am very pissed off, and it will come out now and then. No, I know, I know. At this point, John is aware that Mary is manipulating him, but he goes along with it for the baby. Mary is genuinely moved in the scene because she thinks she's getting everything she's ever wanted. She gets to keep and control John without having to hide so much. 
You can mow the sod in lawn from now on. I do mow the lawn. I do get loads. You really don't. I choose the baby's name. No chance. Okay. It's also notable that only one of them is happy at a time in this scene. At first, Mary is the one who looks relieved while John looks empty. But when Mary mentions Sherlock, John becomes filled with life while Mary literally fades away. He's lovely mum and dad, a fine example of married life, I get that. That is the thing with Sherlock, it's always the unexpected. Oi. Oi. This is a dysfunctional relationship and is doomed to fail. Forever. Because, because John is in love with Sherlock. And because, and because Mary is evil. And working for Moriarty. That's the whole point. <laughs> she never makes any other attempts to get the information back herself either. If she can get someone else to take the risks for her, she will. And at the end of the episode, she's happy that not only has Sherlock taken care of Magnuson for her, but that he's apparently going away forever. Again, she's short-sighted. She's probably not thinking about what's inevitably going to happen when Moriarty comes back publicly. She gloats very subtly in this scene, rubbing in her win over Sherlock one last time. You will look after him for me, won't you? Mm. Don't worry. I'll keep him in trouble. That's my girl. But the plane turns around and Mary is not happy. He's dead. I mean, you told me he was dead, Moriarty. Absolutely. Blew his own brains out. So how can he be back? Well, if he is, he'd better wrap up warm. There's an east wind coming. And ironically, we don't see much of the real Mary in The Abominable Bride, but we do see how Sherlock sees her, specifically that she's, you know, abominable. Nothing has pushed him to the extremes that Mary has. But in all our many adventures together, no case pushed my friend to such mental and physical extremes as that of The Abominable Bride. Good lord. Remember, that's Mary under the veil. He's also aware that John and Mary's relationship is going to fail no matter what. You have recently married a man of a seemingly kindly disposition who has now abandoned you for an unsavory companion of dubious morals. Mary! John. Why in God's name are you pretending to be a client? Because I could think of no other way to see my husband. Husband. But what could you do? Well, what do you do? Except Wander around, taking notes, looking surprised. But John and Mary's relationship dynamic shifts dramatically over the course of the episode because Sherlock is trying to figure out how John really feels about her. When he briefly wakes up, he is reminded of how vulnerable he is around her. I all the details perfect. You've been reading John's blog, the story of how you met. And how not even Mycroft can stop her. What are you doing? Amelia Riccoletti, I'm looking her up. Yeah, I suppose we should. I have access to the top level of the MI5 archive. Yep, that's where I'm looking. What do you think of MI5 security? I think it would be a good idea. Remember, Mycroft is entirely powerless against the villains. So back in his dreams, he tries to change things again, to make it so that Mary could maybe be on their side. That if he tried hard enough, they could all move past this and work together. Even the idea is excruciating. Are you even in a fit state? For Mary, of course. Never doubt that, Watson. Never that. Oh. But he harshly tells himself that he never had any chance with John, that she's always been the one he wanted. I thought I was losing you. I thought perhaps we were neglecting each other. Well, you're the one who moved out. I was talking to Mary. That to John, he's an annoyance, and that he will always pick Mary over him. We have a real-life problem right now. Getting to that, it's next on the list. Just let me do this. Now, everyone always lets you do whatever you want. That's how you got in this state. John, please. I'm not playing this time, Sherlock. Not anymore. When you're ready to go to work, give me a call. I'm taking Mary home. You're what? Mary's taking me home. Better. That scene is one of Sherlock's worst nightmares, second only to being fated to end up with Moriarty. Although notice how one leads to the other. Sherlock, though, resolves all of that in his head in a way that I'll cover in a video that's coming up very soon, and wakes back up. Mary mentions taking Sherlock to the hospital, but is more annoyed than concerned. If you probably just OD'd, you should be in hospital. When Sherlock gets upset with Mycroft for not doing enough to protect him, Mary smiles, enjoying Sherlock's suffering. What are you still doing here? Should it be off getting me a pardon or something? Like a proper big brother? And outside the plane, she's relieved that Sherlock apparently thinks that Moriarty isn't back. I never said he was alive, I said he was back. So he's dead. That means she's less likely to be immediately outed as one of his top operatives. So the main thing to remember here is that not only is John's marriage to Mary doomed to fail because he'd rather be with Sherlock, but to make it even worse, the woman he married is a spy working for Moriarty. That is, that is a doomed marriage 
right there. So where do they take Mary from here? Well, we absolutely have to learn about her past, and we know from the trailer that we will be seeing that. Also, the baby is a ticking time bomb that Mary will have to face, along with Moriarty's return. I am certain that in series four we'll be seeing Mary act more explicitly as a villain, and I'm fairly sure that by the end of this series she'll be gone for good. Whether she's sent to jail for life like Mr. Hudson and Sebastian Moran, or ends up causing her own death like Dr. Franklin remains to be seen, but things with eight GRA are about to get interesting, and I'm excited to see what happens next. Thank you for watching this episode. I consulted these sources when making the video. Since Bronte's account on Tumblr keeps getting deleted, you can find her here instead. I'm so sorry that keeps happening to you. That's really annoying and terrible. You can support the show by contributing subtitles or by becoming a patron on Patreon. The next five videos are all covering various aspects of The Abominable Bride, which I have been looking forward to for months. I'm so happy. It's my favorite. Yes, so I hope you're at least partially as excited as I am. I don't think it's possible to be as excited as I am, but thank you so much for watching, and until next time, get ready to believe! Sorry, I was a little over the top. I'm just very happy to be talking about my favorite episode and like the confirmed, like, I was like some of you and I had like the 99% and then I would doubt occasionally and then the Bonneville Bride came out and was beautiful and we projected it first episode and then just all the things in it and conspiracies and we were right and they told us we were right in the episode and I was just like, I, I love this. And then it was at that point I was so sure that I'm like, you know what? I'm willing to be public about how sure I am about this because I'm not even worried about looking like a massive idiot because I'm right. Because we're right. Because it's going to be fucking awesome. It's abominable, abominable, abominable pride. Okay. Anyway, plus cliff scene again. <laughs> Time for that. Anyway, thanks.